Hello RPG fans and welcome back to the seventh challenge run of this channel. I am Setsuna. If you haven't played this game before, I am Setsuna is mostly relatable to Chrono Trigger from the 90s. And if you haven't played Chrono Trigger, well, we're just not going to go down that rabbit hole. The gameplay, the combat, the story, and the music is mostly relatable to Chrono Trigger as well. And with the music, it is mostly piano based, so you know it's going to be amazing. Short intro this time, so let's go ahead and get to it. Can you beat I Am Setsuna using only Ender? And as always, that's not the only rule that we have in place. Solo Ender when available. No buying or using food outside of what we turn in to get the food. No glitches, exploits, hacks, mods, free or paid DLC if there is any. And our victory condition is to beat the final storyline boss. When I originally started this run, the rule set was very different and I had no plans of doing a solo run until I saw the option to where you had the ability to remove party members from your party. This option was presented to me after about an hour into the game when additional party members joined the party and it forced me to the party menu and I saw the option to remove party members. Prior to this, I had no options or reason to click on the party menu at the time. So for all intents and purposes, this is a solo run. So we first start off in a snowy forest, making our way through the mobs. And this is kind of like a tutorial section. We get taught how to do combat and how to use skills if we want. And originally I was going to make this playthrough to where we don't use skills or techniques or combos. So in this game, just like Chrono Trigger, there are combos depending on how many people you have in your party and what skills you have equipped. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, there's 63 double combos and 70 triple combos across seven characters. So that is a lot of different options. That is 133 fun things that we don't get to do. The overall concept of the story is every X amount of years, a sacrifice is sent from the village knife to basically keep the monsters at bay. And the sacrifice knows what their duty is and that they will die at the end of their pilgrimage. So as we're controlling Ender, his main objective is to actually kill the sacrifice before the sacrifice begins the journey. The villagers tell us that the sacrifice is up in the Falling Snow Monument, so we'll make our way through the forest and enter the monument where we find the sacrifice. Upon confronting her, Ender draws his sword asking if she is the sacrifice, and she replies yes, and then she introduces herself as Setsuna. She will then not demand, but ask us to not kill her as she explains that her life will be ending soon regardless. Ender decides not to swing his sword, and Setsuna gets rescued by two people who they put us in some type of magical holding spell. Soon after, monsters start attacking the village, and Setsuna comes in to free us from the binds and sets us free. We decide to help to defend the village from the enemies, and Eterna joins our party. There's several groups throughout the town, but we make quick work of them. After the eradication of the little ones, White Wind descends from the sky and tries to take us all on with a big flap of his wings. White Wind can catch you by surprise by doing a lot of damage to a character. If you're not able to heal them up in time, he can wipe your party, but it really shouldn't be an issue. Use Setsuna to heal and you'll be just fine. After the battle, a Turna isn't so quick to forgive Ender for trying to kill Setsuna, but Setsuna asks the village and a Turna for forgiveness on our behalf and wants Ender to protect her throughout the pilgrimage. So this is the first time the party menu pops up and as you can see in the top right, the remove from party is grayed out. I head over to the forest and do a couple sweeps of mob kills so that way I can gain a little bit of experience and monster materials before we set out on our pilgrimage journey. In I Am Setsuna, depending on how you kill the mobs, it determines what kind of material they drop essentially. So for example, if I were to kill them with a fire sword, it would drop, let's just say, a stone. But if I were to kill them with a water sword, that would be water elemental damage, then they might drop a feather, just for example. So all throughout this playthrough, you want to try and kill the mobs with as many different types of kills as you can. There will be a link in the description for all the different types of kills, as well as a walkthrough and a monster drop list of materials. And so now your next question might be, well, what would be the purpose of doing that? 
So by getting all these materials that drop from the monsters, you could then sell them to a particular NPC in town. And depending on what you sell, it unlocks essentially abilities that you can use on your character to make you get stronger. And there's two different kinds. Um, these abilities are called Spirit Knights. There's Command Spirit Knight, which is like your attack abilities or abilities that let you heal other people. And these Command Spirit Knights are also the ones that determine if you can do double combos or triple combos with the rest of your party. And then there is Support Spirit Knights, which are like your passive abilities. It's quite common to go throughout the entire game and not actually worry about what you have equipped for the most part, because if you're using three people, chances are you'll be able to clear the game just fine. Since I'm doing a solo character, it's a I'm definitely going to be running into some roadblocks later on, but at the moment, I don't really care about how many different types of ways I kill an enemy or the materials that I'm getting. So progressing through the story, we go from the Knife Village over to the dock and here on the boat we get attacked by the Loch Ness Monster. His AoE can hurt a decent bit, but it's nothing that some potions or Setsuna's cure won't be able to recover, so just keep physically attacking or using techs or combos. Just take down his HP bar and he'll fall within like a minute and a half. We'll find ourselves shipwrecked and then Upon proceeding on to mainland, we will go ahead and head north into this next town of Sirendale, where we will encounter a familiar looking person, if you've looked at any sort of guides or playthroughs at all, and we will encounter Niter. After the dialogue is exhausted, we will proceed north of Sirendale, and then we will go east over to the Fort of Purica. This is the NPC I was referring to that you'll want to sell all of your monster materials. When you go to the sell menu for him, all of the white materials are the monster materials that you'll want to sell him. The green materials can be used in food recipes if you want. This NPC and selling the monster materials is also going to be your main source of money making throughout this game. So while we're inside the fort, we find the house that has all of the merchants and we go ahead and stock up on restorative items and we visit the blacksmith and buy some weapons. With all of the monster materials that we've accrued so far on the same menu where we sell to the NPC, there will be a obtain spirit knight option. Once you click on that, you will see a list of all of the available spirit knight that you can purchase and for what character they can be equipped on. For probably the first half of this walkthrough, maybe a little bit more, our main damaging skill on Ender is going to be Cyclone. Cyclone is a massive AoE that hits everyone in a 360, but it does have a limit as to how far away it can hit, but for the most part, it hits about, I'd say, 60% of the screen. In order to proceed, we need the cave entrance unlocked, so we go ahead and talk to the captain of this Fort Purica, and she wants us to teach the recruits on how to fight, so we go ahead and mop the floor with them and do just that. She says that she's going to go on one final patrol before joining us at the cave, and so we go ahead and wait in her house for quite a while, and then the party starts to get worried, at which time we will head out of the town just to find her on the ground. We'll proceed our way back to Serendale and off to the right hand side once entering, and we will come across the Reaper who was the one who attacked the captain. With this being our first of many fights with him, he doesn't really do anything special, so once more just use Setsuna's tech for curing people and potions if you need to, and then just continue to whittle away the Reaper's health bar and he'll fall within one to two minutes. After reaping the Reaper, we go ahead and go back to the Fort Purica and the captain is miraculously feeling better. She then takes us as well as Niter over to the cave and she unlocks it for us. And we are now presented with the menu to where the remove from party option is no longer grayed out. And it was at this moment where I was just like, you know what, let's try and do a solo ender run instead. And so we do just that. In the world map, towns, dungeons, there's no mini map at all. So you'll have to kind of remember where you came from and where you've already been and you'll progress your way through these dungeons. For the first half of the game, I would say that they're mostly pretty linear, and the mobs do not respawn unless you change zones. So making our way through the cave, we come across our first real boss fight, and being solo nonetheless. 
The Primeval Tortoise's damage output isn't really anything special, it's nothing that potions can't recover. He'll usually hit us for about 50 damage and then eventually he'll curl up into his shell, which you can still attack him, but his defense is essentially doubled so you'll be doing half of the physical damage that you normally would. And then eventually he'll just spin around, which is meant as an AoE to the entire party, but since we are using only Ender, then of course it it acts like a single target since we don't have any other party members, but the damage output is really easy to manage. And since I'm revisiting this game, I didn't remember the momentum combat feature. So if you see my ATB bar, there's a bubble just to the right of it that's got three um, white lights at the top. Every time your SP bar fills all the way to the top, you get one of those light pips. And what those do is when you use an attack or a ability and you immediately press square after you initiate the command, you do what's known as a momentum boost for that skill. So depending on what the skill does, you'll get different types of momentum boosts. So for Cyclone, it adds additional damage to everything that it hits. I'm not exactly sure how far into the playthrough I remembered that. I mean, it can't be too much further, but for the purposes of this battle, I completely forgot about it. So this battle could have taken half the time. And also to note, since I'm doing solo Ender, he gets the full amount of the experience and all of the characters who are not in your party receive 50% of the experience. He then tells us that he's sending refugees over to a separate town called Tenderville, so that's going to be our next stop. We make our way to the king of the castle and we ask him how we can get across the ocean. He tells us that if his shipwright was available, whose name is Akash, then we would have an airship to fly over the gap, but Akash is nowhere to be found. I go back to the frost cave for a couple more rounds to level up some more and get some more monster materials before heading out. When I feel like I'm ready and good enough to proceed, I head north and we go into the Mistlay Woods. The Mistlay Woods has a lot of opportunities to back attack their creatures, which gives us an immediate one momentum point. And this is going to be absolutely critical for the entire playthrough, regardless if you're playing solo, duo, or triple characters, you'll always want to try and initiate back attacks to get that one additional momentum pip, because that also gives you first strike. We come across a little boy who's about to be attacked by some monsters and we come to his rescue and it turns out we can actually name this character. So that must mean that he's probably going to be a party member. So we'll stick with the default name of Kerr. Entering the town, I'll do my normal routine of restocking on recovery items if I need to and checking the blacksmith if any new weapons have been introduced. From here, we go to the bottom right hand house where we talk to the village chief, Dinus. Dinus advises that he might know where Akash is, so he writes us a letter beforehand and then we go all the way back to the castle and go into the pub. We'll find Akash in the pub in the bottom left hand corner and he tries to play off like he doesn't know who we're looking for. And then we eventually show him a letter from Dinus, who was the original lord of the castle. Akash quickly changes his tune and says that he'll help us. Originally, he didn't want anything to do with the current lord, as he thinks he's a very bad person that would only further his own means with the use of the airship. We'll go and talk to the king, and he's really happy that we found Akash, and then he's just like, Mwahaha, I'm an evil king. Oh, I bet you didn't expect that. And then he paralyzes all of us into a hold and then takes the sacrifice and Kerr away. Eterna breaks us free and we fight some random battles and we'll head over to a previously locked gate on the west side of town. Aiden tells the guards to let us pass and the guards are extremely thankful that the former king is there. And it makes us wonder what the current king is doing as to why the guards even want the old king back. And we come across the first real boss fight of the game, the Wolf Baron. Sitting at 1, 2, 3, 4 HP, this dude has quite the health pool. He attacks extremely quickly and extremely hard. On average, he'll get about two attacks in for every one that we do. This boss handed me my first, second, third, and I believe fourth game over. So I'm only going to show you the victory clip. And now I know what you're thinking. You're so good at video games. How can you die to this guy? Well, let me show you. So he'll use an attack called Deadly Bite, and this is probably his most dangerous attack because it locks our momentum usage. 
Now remember, the momentum usage is when the SP bubble fills all the way up and we get those momentum pips at the top. And that's what allows us to do a lot of damage really quickly. And he locks that ability. So the only way that we can cure this, actually, I think there's two ways. One is just let the timer on it fall off, or we can use a panacea item, which removes all status alignment effects on us. I also go through a lot of potions. So because potions is our only means of healing at the moment, we do want to make sure that we have a very healthy supply of them. We will eventually get a command spirit knight called Aura, which is a massive heal, and it is the best in slot heal for the entire game. We'll be getting that pretty soon. So now that we've covered his damage output, let's talk about mine. So I'm really only able to do damage after he attacks me twice and I make sure that I'm at enough health to where if he attacks me twice again, I'm not going to die. So a lot of it is uh, reaction based damage rather than just trying to go gung ho and down him. Once the boss reaches about 50% HP, he will then become enraged and transform with lightning around him. What this is going to do is increase his damage a lot to where we're going to have to be a lot more picky about when we choose to attack. This was almost a six and a half minute fight. Proceeding through the door that he was guarding, it turns out that only Kerr is here. We were expecting Setsuna to be here as well, but she's not. So we'll go back on the deck where it's revealed what the king's plans are. He keeps sending everyone over to that tender bill village so that way they can be sacrificed to the monsters and they will leave the castle alone. What an amazing king this is. We are then interrupted by the Reaper who wants to kill the sacrifice. Both the Reaper and the Spirit Knight device have 1,274 HP. However, the Spirit Knight device only takes half damage and it doesn't have any turns. So our main focus is only going to be on the Reaper. He hits a lot harder than before, but once again, it's nothing that some potions can't deal with. And this time he doesn't lock our momentum gauge so we can just sit back and wait for that to build up and then expend all of those in rapid succession to take him down. Probably should have mentioned this a little bit earlier, but in order for your SP gauge to fill up, your ATB bar needs to be all the way max. And then anything that's left over after the ATB bar essentially gets put into that SP gauge and fills it up. It also gets recovered when you take damage and deal damage. Overall, this was about a five minute fight. This was the ship that we were going to use to sail across the ocean, but since the king overloaded the reactor, so to speak, and we had to shut it down before it exploded, we're going to have to find an alternative way. And Kerr mentions that his village might know something. So we'll make our way back through the woods and eventually Kerr will do a forced cinematic type deal to where he'll tell us where we need to go. So about right here is when he will tell us that we need to go through the forest and we'll appear on the other side. So we'll do just that. And then our next objective is the mountain. So in the mountain, we'll be able to navigate our way through these two stone type structures. It actually acts as a hidden path. And towards the exit, we will come across this spirit knight eaten mob, which is essentially like a super mob. When this thing is farmable very, very soon, it offers 1000 experience every time we kill it. And it respawns by us exiting the zone to the left and then coming right back in, fighting a, a random mob and then onto this thing again. So an entire rotation can take maybe a minute, minute and a half, depending on your RNG of actually hitting this spirit knight eaten mob. It's got 50% magical evasion and 90% physical evasion. So I use shock for the most part and just RNG it until it falls and then rinse repeat. This is a massive power leveling spot that I fully take advantage of since I'm doing a solo run. After exiting the mountain, there's only one area that we can go, which is Kerr's home in the forest. We need to heal Setsuna as she's becoming a spirit knight eaten mob, essentially. Her body is overflowing with it. Kira doesn't think he's strong enough to use his magic to heal Setsuna, so he wants to get his hidden powers back from the stone just to the north of the village. I take this time, instead of going north, I go back to that Spirit Knight mob that I was just referencing, and I grind here until I'm level 23. Now that I think I'm prepared enough, I go ahead and accompany Kerr to the stone north of his village, where he tries to draw out his magical powers that were sealed away, and I have to protect him against waves of mobs. So I do just that and then head back to town where it is also under attack and then I come across our next boss fight. 
The Time Slave. This fight took a whopping six minutes. I'm noticing that these bosses are starting to progressively get longer and longer. This boss can do several things. He has quite the arsenal of damage output abilities, and he has two abilities um, such as slow and stop. Slow, as you can imagine, makes my ATB gauge fill up not as quickly, whereas stop would stop me completely. So with stop in this game, if you have a three person party, stop just reduces that character's turns that they can take by one entire rotation. But if you have a single character and you get stopped, it's an automatic game over. And you may be wondering how I would know that. Wink, wink. He will sometimes cast confusion on us. Now with confusion in this game, whenever that character deals damage, you essentially deal a percentage of that damage to yourself. So with this being a solo run, it is pretty critical to get that status removed with smelling salts or the panacea. And later in the game, we could actually one shot ourselves if we do not remove the confuse effect. When the time slave reaches 50% HP, his damage output and his defenses are going to double. So this means that I want to try and have all three momentum charges ready for when he uses Rampage, then I can quickly try and spike him down. And that strategy worked out pretty well. I was continuously using some potions to heal myself back up and this dude falls. Our next destination is the Twalisk Mountain, which is no big deal to navigate. It's just like any other mountain that we've come across so far. So we go ahead and get through it. And then our next step is the Floberg Waters. The party thinks that in order to make our way across the frozen ice that we will need a guide. So we go ahead and press south and exit the Floberg waters and reach the next town, Royberg. We notice that the town is empty except for a little boy who's getting attacked by monsters. So we go ahead and save him and then he tells us that everyone's been captured and taken to the cave. Following the cave, we go ahead and clear it out, saving everyone. And then we come across a pseudo boss fight or a pseudo mini boss. But the little boy turns into a monster and then after we beat him he goes crying to his mama in the next room. Setsuna steps in and is now part of the Monsters Lives Matters movement. So we go ahead and head to the beginning of the cave where we encounter our next future party member, Julianne. Julianne appears to be taking her duties extremely seriously and wants to eliminate the monster immediately. It's only when we get back to town that we find out that this isn't how Julianne actually acts. Some time ago, she went on an expedition and got caught in an avalanche and she was never heard from for a couple months. Upon her return, she seemed completely changed and everyone didn't know what happened or why. I restock, resupply, and I visit this Spirit Knight NPC a lot throughout this playthrough. This is also where I equip the Aura Command Spirit Knight, which allows a self-heal of essentially a full heal every turn if I wanted. And one of the great things about it is if I use the heal and then press square for a momentum bonus, it will cure all status alignments on me at the same time as well. Julianne abruptly gives an order to destroy all the enemies within the near vicinity. So Setsuna, with her alarms going off, says that we need to head back to the cave and check in on the little boy again. So we do that. So we give the boy a warning and he hightails it out of there in the same direction that Julianne is coming from, the entrance of the cave. So I'm not exactly sure how they miss each other. That seems like a little bit of an oversight in my opinion. Back in town when we talk to Lyalis, he tells us the backstory of Julianne and how she came to be the way she is right now, and he says that if we can cure her of whatever is possessing her or whatever demonic form she's carrying, then he will be our guide across the Floberg waters, which is exactly what we need to do. So we go to the Floberg waters and destroy the orange looking pangies and obtain the spirit knight needed for the consortium member to make a antidote. Cornelius administers the antidote and Julianne feels just like her normal self and she now joins the party. Now that we have our guide, we can proceed through the waters which will lead us to our next boss fight, King Hoppy. With Cyclone being our main damaging ability, we can take all the adds out in one fell swoop using a momentum bonus. If you don't kill the adds quick enough, he'll start to fuse with them, becoming twice as strong. So yeah, just don't let that happen. He'll start to resummon them when he gets lower on HP, so just be sure to have a momentum ready to deal with him. He doesn't hit hard, so we just keep pressing the attack and he'll go down within a couple minutes, nothing special. 
Next up is the Arkhamel Ruins, and a pretty cool cutscene plays out in here. Ender and Niter end up falling to the ground and they're transported into essentially Niter's dream world, where he finds out that Setsuna is actually his daughter. Yeah, his daughter. Towards the end of the ruins, we come across the Reaper a third time, and he goes down a lot quicker this time because I'm actually using the momentum bonus attacks with Cyclone whereas I wasn't before, so he goes down within a couple minutes and he doesn't really hit that hard. And while this looks pretty easy for doing a solo run challenge, believe you me, that changes very quickly later on. Proceeding north out of the ruins, we come across our next town, Gatherington. This is a great place to restock, resupply, and buy some new equipments and talismans from the blacksmith vendor. With Ender's new weapon, the Phantasma, this will be our weapon for a pretty decent amount of time. So if you don't have the money for this, then go ahead and backtrack to the ruins or to the next area, get the monster materials, sell them, and get this weapon because you definitely do not want to go without it. Making our way north of the town, we enter the next area, the Fridging Caves. These mobs in here offer some pretty decent amount of experience. So it may be worth your while leveling up here for, I don't know, 10 to 20 minutes. And then you'll eventually come across a sealed path, a wall of ice that looks a little bit suspicious. And the party's not quite sure how to get through here. So we go ahead and go back to town and see if anyone knows how to get through there. When heading up to the healer's house on the far east side of town, Julianne falls and shortly leaves the party. The gloomy old woman, also known as Sayagi, it tells us that she casted a magic barrier that made everyone essentially forget that the cave entrance was there because she sealed an enemy inside and didn't want anyone messing around with it. So she tells us about it and then she gives us an item that allows us to open up the entrance where we go and fight one of the toughest bosses of the game so far. This boss, the Aurorian Tiger, gave me a handful of game overs and I was really wondering if this was even possible. Here's my gear going into the fight. I've got the Phantasma weapon, non-tempered, by the way. Chain of Newborn Cries, as well as my Spirit Stones equipped. Keep in mind the Spirit Stones that I have equipped are not best in slot, as well as the bonuses that are on all of them are not best in slot. I'm just kind of throwing them on as I get them, not really caring because I know that I'm going to be replacing most of this in the end game anyway. This boss has been known to be one of the hardest bosses in the entire game, assuming you even have a three person party as well. So after I was reading that, I was kind of like, OK, well, I'm doing this solo. So what's the boss's damage output going to be like? It took me quite a few attempts to get to this point. So we're just going to show the victory fight. So essentially, the main part of what I'm doing on this fight is Again, I'm reacting to what he is doing. I'm not taking the initiative to do damage because he will again get two turns while I only get one. So I need to make sure that I am fully healed for when he changes forms. Every time he changes forms, he does one of two things. The fire and gale forms, he will do a massive combo to me, which I have to heal afterwards. He will also switch to a water form and it only hits me twice, which is my opportunity to counter attack the boss if my HP is up to par. Because I have to remember if he does two switches to Gale and Flame, that will destroy my health bar. I will most likely get a game over if he uses those two forms back to back on me. So I'd probably say 80% of this fight is just me healing myself, waiting for the opportunity to attack. But you know, it is what it is. This was the strategy that I came up with and it's the strategy that worked. I was getting a little nervous every time he dropped my HP to critical status, but I felt pretty confident that with the few times that I already fought him, this strategy would work. And even if he dropped me to critical, I would be able to use Aura, which is a full heal. I could use that every single turn if I wanted and just wait for my chance to strike with a momentum cyclone. So one of the spirit stones that I have equipped is called Returner. So what that does is every time I'm dealt damage, I recover part of my MP. And that's extremely important because as these fights go on and as I progress further into the game, 
having to manually recover my MP with a ether could actually mean life or death for me because I'm taking a turn when I could be healing myself or doing damage to recover my MP pool. And that actually did uh, be the case in one of the future boss fights in the game to where I had to throw Returner back on. Otherwise, I wasn't able to beat the fight because I was spending my time using an ether instead of healing myself. So for most of the game, when we have the Returner, it is infinite MP gain and sustainability. So we got that part taken care of. We also have a spirit stone that gives us the ability to evade physical attacks, which is absolutely clutch. That skill or spirit stone is so good for a solo playthrough. It saved me countless times. While I didn't attempt this boss a lot of times, the fights are extremely long because of how many turns I have to take healing myself in preparation for a attack opening. So this fight, took about 15 minutes. I was so excited when this boss was defeated, it meant that I can continue the run. I immediately head back up the ramp and save it, and then our next destination is the Fridging Heights. The Fridging Heights is a pretty awesome area for EXP grinding at this point in the game, but the next zone after this area is one of the best in the game. And also keep in mind what I consider best in the game is strictly based off of my own experience because I'm playing with a single character. If you're using a full party of three, then there's much better areas that you would be able to gain experience at. The Fridging Heights was supposed to be the area that connects us to the last stand, but as we get up onto this cliff, we notice that there is no path over there. The land that is connecting this gap is just gone. So now we are in quite the conundrum of figuring out what to do. And while we're trying to figure out what to do, Eterna magically disappears. Julianne starts to get taken over by some evil dark force again and leaves the party. So now we go from six to four members. So we go back to town and then that's when the party has a notion of, hey, what about the Akash guy? I wonder where he is. And some villagers mentioned that he went north up to the Magna Valley. And the Magna Valley, in my opinion, is the best spot in the game right now for a solo character to level up. The mobs here die in one hit or one momentum attack, I should say. So we'll rest, recover, restock, and head all the way up to the Magna Valley, and then we will head east once inside, and there we will encounter Akash, who has this green type looking glow to him. And my immediate thought before the dialogue continued was, is he like going number two over here? And we weren't far off. In order for him to avoid enemies, he's actually covering himself in the feces of the enemies. Furthering the conversation with Akash, he needs a spirit stone in order to activate his new airship that he's going to build. And he believes it's in the ruins and we can't get in the ruins without someone from the royal bloodline of the knighthood. So that leads us to Julianne, but Julianne's nowhere to be found. So we're kind of in a little bit of a pickle right now on where to go. With the purple barrier down now because we killed the Aurorian Tiger, we go ahead and take a shortcut back over to Royberg, where we encounter our biggest wall of the entire game. When entering the town, we are warmly greeted by the guards drawing their weapons and then quickly lowering them once they find out that we are no longer monsters. The town has been getting attacked quite heavily, and so it's now our job to defend the town. And this is where the wall I was talking about comes into play. After talking to the kids in the chief's house, we head out and the monsters are attacking. We defeat several waves of mobs before encountering the boss, the Stout Sheep. The Stout Sheep has a massive 5,332 HP pool. And that itself isn't really the issue. It's when he gets 50% HP, he will then use his Huddle ability, which restores anywhere from 700 to 1000 HP per turn, depending on how much HP he is at when he uses that ability. So if you get him exactly down to 50%, he'll heal for 799 per tick, and it will usually last like four ticks, four to five ticks. So essentially, 
he's going to recover himself back up to full HP within like three or four of my ATB turns. And if that wasn't bad enough, when you get him down to, I believe it's like 1000 or 1500 HP, he will then use his hibernate ability, which immediately restores 1000 health for his turn. And so while he's using that, your ATB bar actually isn't filling up because that's counting as his action for the turn. So the first time I fought this guy, I was kind of thinking to myself, how in the hell am I going to do enough damage to out damage a 800 a tick heal? And the simple answer was need to go grind. I did a lot of different types of tactics, spirit stone equips, um, spirit stone command abilities. So I went from cyclone to cleave and then I decided to ultimately end up on radiance. I'm also level 32 at the moment going into this fight for the first time. I must have tried this guy like 10 times throughout the entire day trying to see if my damage was enough, different strategies, just everything I can think of. And I have about eight to 10 hours of grinding footage that I just cut out. All of this will be available on the unedited uploads that I believe I'll put them on my secondary YouTube channel for those who are interested, but it's all there. So yeah, eight to 10 hours of grinding in the Magna Valley. That's a long time. After 10 hours of grinding and redistributing all of my equipment, my spirit stones, etc. Here is my equipment going into the fight that actually downs the boss. It's kind of funny too because I was complaining about this boss in my discord and then like just a few minutes after I was complaining about this boss I end up downing him. This boss I was right on the verge of considering this run failed just because of how much damage I have to deal this thing even with him healing himself. This fight was just the most insane thing I've ever experienced in this game so far. It was extremely frustrating to try and think of a way to beat this thing. And this was a boss that didn't really have any guides online because no one's done this game solo. So any guides that were out there were completely useless because it was meant for a three person party. All right, Azure, enough flexing. Let's get to the fight. So all of the boss's attacks are physical. So that means the spirit stone that we have that can make us evade physical attacks is really paying dividends during this fight. I think with all the leveling up I did and all the extra uh, fluxes that I was able to put on other pieces of gear that allowed or other pieces of spirit stones rather that allowed me to stack up my dodge rating a little bit more really paid dividends in this fight. So right off the bat, we want to max out our momentum charges, and this is mostly because we're going to try and drop him to as close to 50% HP as possible. And then when he starts regening from his huddle ability, which was the 800 per tick, we're going to just completely power through all of our momentum pips and try and down him as quickly as possible. Now, of course, that's the plan, but it doesn't really work out that well. So when I do get him down to 50% and he does that, I get him down to about 1000 HP after I burn all of my momentum pips and he's still healing for 800. So I think he has one more tick left. And with the attacks that he's using against me, I'm evading a lot of them. And so I keep pressing the attack. At this point, it's basically just RNG because once his huddle wears off, he does have the ability to use it again. So it's basically just a DPS race on if I can keep attacking him before he uses his huddle again. He also has a ferocious charge ability that if it crits, it will one shot me, which I found out a couple attempts ago. So with a full party, this is one of the easiest fights in the game. But as a solo person, this was one of the hardest fights in the game. And I think you can see why couple more attempts and I would have considered this a failed run. I was on the verge of bringing in other party members just to get through this boss and counting this as a failure for the run, but still continuing to try and beat it. So I'm super, super glad that the 10 hours of grinding and everything that I did to 
re-equip my character spirit stones paid off and we're able to progress this run. With the town now safe, we go ahead and talk to the aspiring researcher who's up in the top left house who gives us some ideas as to how we can open up the Magna Ruins gate. And the key has to be with the song that the children were singing. When trying to leave town, a caution Cornelius enter in saying that Julianne tried to attack them in the Magna Valley. It's kind of our only option at this point because we don't have a spirit stone that Akash needs for his new airship and he hasn't even built it yet. So our only option to try and get into the ruins is with Julian. So we go and talk to the Siyagi healer and she tells us what we need to do in order to try and release Julian from the possession. Siyagi hands us a spirit stone and then we are entered in a one-on-one -on -one combat with her. Our only goal right here is to keep Setsuna healed enough to where the stone is fully charged. And this is not a failed run because it's still technically a solo battle, just not with Endir. The battle will automatically end when the stone is charged, so we'll go ahead and exit the town and then go over to the Magna Valley where Julian lies in front of the tomb. Now that Julian is back in our party, she opens up the doorway for us and we can proceed inward. It is very important to save outside of here as it is quite a while before the next save point. There's four areas that we need to make our way through, and at the end of each area we get asked a question in order to proceed. If we get the question wrong, then we have to restart the area with the mobs respawn. So the answers to the questions are he was unjust. The second area is don't eliminate her. Third area is Eterna. And then the fourth area is yes. At the end of the ruins, we will fight the person who's been speaking to us all this time, Rydurch. He wants to verify that we have what it takes in order to control the royal airship, so he thrusts us into battle. Starting off, we go ahead and use our AoE Radiance and it one-shots all of the adds, so no big deal. He will start to summon these throughout the fight if your DPS isn't up to par. He sits at 4200 HP while the adds only sit at 280, so at this point pretty much anything you do should be able to one-shot the adds. He's got several attacks that don't really do too much damage. He has a skill called Demi, so that does a decent amount of damage to us. He can use Osmosis, which takes our MP away, which isn't really that big of an issue. And then he can also cast Stop. Now Stop, as I mentioned before, if we get inflicted with it, is, is an automatic game over for us. So essentially it is kind of like an RNG or DPS race to kill him before he uses it. When he gets at about 1 3rd HP, he will start to cast Holy Light or Flare, which means of course that his damage will be ramping but with how we are equipped right now this boss goes down extremely quickly once we obtain the royal airship we do get to name it so have fun i was thinking about naming mine balam you know balam garden but i just decided against it with the airship in our possession this is one of the few opportunities that we'll have to backtrack and do all of the side content if we want also, if you have three people, this is a pretty good opportunity to get upgraded weapons for everyone, so be sure to do that. For me, though, I'm going to forego all of the side content because I want to, one, of course, see if the game is beatable using a solo character, but I also don't really want to try and level up too much more. I really want to see if we can beat the game with our current power level. I do make one side trip to the Dazshire Woods and pick up the Braveheart Talisman. What this does is it gives you a physical attack boost increase. I did want to show this area real quick. This area is up in the top left hand corner of the map. You can find a map of I Am Setsuna online, but this area is so cool. I mean, just look at everything, how pixeled it is, the art, and the devs and everything kind of added in their own character and say thanks for playing the game, thanks for buying the game. I thought this was a really cool area. And so moving on, we visit three places and pick up the locked chests. These locked chests were the silver chests throughout the game that you couldn't pick up before and now you can. Uh, so I pick up three of them that had auriculum in it and these auriculum is used to temper our weapons. It is the best temper in the game for the weapons. So I pick up, I believe it's three or four chests worth. So that way we can get one of our weapons maxed, but I don't use them yet. We will be using them on the rainbow weapon. Sound familiar? Chrono Trigger. 
as I think I'm fully prepared, fully stocked and whatnot to continue on to the storyline, we are now ready to enter the Last Lands. So we go ahead and fly our airship over to the Last Lands. There's a small patch of snow that we can land on outside, and once inside, we will go ahead and run straight north up into the castle. This castle isn't exactly linear, but there is, of course, a limit as to where you could go. So I mainly skip most of the chests in here, and I just go straight to where we get our best in slot weapon, the rainbow, which is used for Ender, and then we go ahead and temper it with the auriculum that we got from the chests. I'm currently level 51 heading into this place, and this place gives a lot of experience. If you're under leveled, you will have no problem leveling up in here. These battles give about 2000 EXP per. Upon reaching the end of this tower, we will come across a save point, and I'll go ahead and show my current equipment here. So fighting the Reaper again, this is kind of like a precursor fight to the actual boss fight. The Reaper only has 2200 HP and he can die within one to two combos. So for here, I use one momentum radiance followed by a regular radiance. And most of the time that did end up killing him, but sometimes it didn't. And he ended up using black hole, which completely zeroed me out. So I did die to this guy several times, which was a little bit unfortunate. If he doesn't use Black Hole, he's a complete pushover. And also keep in mind, whatever HP and MP you are at when the Reaper dies is what you will start off at during the next fight. So most of the time when I was trying to make sure I was fully recovered before actually downing the Reaper is when the Reaper would use Black Hole and he would zero me out. So it was a little unfortunate. And now for the actual hardest boss in the game, in my opinion, the Dysmorphic Monster. So what makes this boss hard, besides the fact that I'm only playing a solo character, is the fact that he essentially has a one-shot ability. Ever so often he will use a skill called Swallow, and so he will do just like it sounds, he will swallow a character, and it does two ticks of damage upon him grabbing me and then swallowing me, but he also heals for whatever damage he does, which that's not really the issue. And then when he spits you back out, it does even more damage than when he ate you. So here's just how much damage he's doing right now. Assuming I don't dodge any of his physical attacks right there, he does two ticks of 160 on me when he picks me up and swallows me. And then when he spits me back out, it's 240. So that right there is 560 damage worth when my HP pool is only 500. And if that wasn't bad enough, when he spits me out, it resets my ATB bar. So then he also gets another guaranteed attack off, which usually hits anywhere from 160 to 200, which means in order for me to even survive that attack, I have to have about 720 to 760 HP, which the only way I can get that is by getting up to level 80. So yeah, that's what I've been dealing with. And aside from all that goodness, he has the ability to lock my momentum gauge. And that hurts. So after wiping several times on this guy, I was revisiting my spirit stones. And then I found one that I was just like, hey, I wonder if this will work. So the spirit stone we picked up earlier called parries. So what that does is triggering momentum mode when receiving an attack will reduce the damage received. So my thought was always have a momentum available for defensive purposes, not offensive purposes. So when I see him use swallow up at the top where it says the skill that the enemy's using, as soon as I recognize that, I would spam square as fast as I can in the hopes that I would get that trigger off. And instead of him doing 160 per tick for the two ticks, it would be 80 per tick. And we actually got to do that. It was successful in doing that, but it did not decrease the damage on the tick when he spit us out. That was full damage if I wasn't able to dodge it completely. So on the kill attempt, he missed a lot of physical attacks. And we also had a proc of one of our spirit stones that had all resistance plus 100. So essentially, regardless of what he did, he did zero damage. It was the most RNG thing I've ever seen in this game. It was for 
all intents and purposes and no pun intended an absolute game changer we also had the singularity proc to where the sp gauge was rapidly accelerated so we were able to get several attacks off in a row of just momentum radiance it was such a thing of beauty this was the most rng fight i've ever seen or experienced in this game so far and without it i don't think that this fight could really be beatable there has to be some type of rng i think unless you're grinding to level 80 solo i yelled so loud when this boss went down i'm pretty sure it woke up the other side of the world so naturally i go back down the stairs and save it before continuing on into the portal in the throne room upon entering the portal eterna starts to give us a little bit of a backstory as to who she actually is as we progress deeper down into this dungeon as we reach the last save point of the game we'll go ahead and head up the stairs and talk to the time judge some cinematics play out and it turns out eterna is actually the time judge's clone the time judge was locked in place here and the sacrifices that were being sent over and over and over were to actually feed her the magical energy to keep this barrier in place. And so as the time judge, she was continuously redoing time over and over and over until a group of people decided to make a different choice and actually fight the dark Samsara, which is the enemy inside the barrier. So for however long this has existed, the same party of us have made the same choice over and over to avoid combat and continue with the sacrifice. And now the times have changed. I did game over once before on the time judge. She ended up using stop and it was successful on me. So that was a game over, which was really unfortunate and quite frustrating, to be honest because if I was in a three-person party, it would just stop that character from acting for one turn. But, you know, with a solo person, it's just a game over. So her attacks don't hit particularly hard. She'll start off with some physical attacks, which deal like 170. So I can usually let her have two turns of attacking me and then I'll heal while restoring my momentum pips. And then she'll also cast slow on me and that can be remedied with the panacea once she starts to get about 50 percent hp or so she'll start to use shooting star which doesn't do a lot of damage at all i imagine if it crit it would but i don't know if it's capable of critting it also hits for about 170 a piece so i usually let her have two of those and when she's at about 50 percent just by going from 50 percent to zero it only takes about three momentum radiance attacks and that's exactly what we do to finish her off Naturally, while building up the momentum pips, we will keep using aura preferably unless we have a status effect and then in which case we'll be using a panacea. We are also still having that return spirit stone on us, so every time we're dealt damage, we're gaining MP. While this boss in the end didn't really prove that difficult, I was still really excited that I was able to down this boss because that's just one less boss that I have to beat to try and complete this run. Right here is the point of no return, so we'll go ahead and save it. And if you need to do any other side content or have some things unfinished, you can use the portal on this platform to exit out. But for me, I'm going to go ahead and try and finish the game. Here's my equipment going into the final area. And this boss has two different versions. There's a weak version and a souped up version. The souped up version has those four orbs that you see above him right now. And in order to stay that way, just go and engage the boss directly. But if you want to weaken him, there's four pillars throughout this area. As you can see, there's four pillars, two on the left, two on the right. Each one of those are like mini bosses that we can beat. And every time we beat one of those, one of those orbs disappears. So that's what we're going to do because this is a solo run. I don't want to face the super souped up version because I just have a bad feeling about it. So on the bird, the turtle, and the Loch Ness monster, I use the same tactics for all three of those to where I build up some momentum pips and then just chain the boss down and they die within two momentum attacks. Really nothing special. Now the Aurorian Tiger Mob, on the other hand, I saved this one for last because I didn't know what to expect, but I probably should have done it first in case I got a game over. But its damage output and its turns were pretty predictable compared to the other bosses that I fought in here as well. So just by understanding how I beat this guy the first time, I employed the same strategy to where I would be reactive and not just press the attack right away. 
and this boss also fell extremely quickly. I think it was three momentum radiance attacks. I'm so close to being able to complete this run solo that I hope I don't make a mistake. I'm so close to being able to complete this run solo that I really needed to just calm my nerves, understand the fight. I need to be reactive right off the bat so that way I don't overextend my damage and then end up dying. All right, so jumping into it, he does have some physical attacks that hit for about 140 to 170 or so, really nothing special. And then he also has some space time attacks that do about 100 damage. I don't know if they're supposed to add status effects. It was really weird, like 90% of the time he used them, it either dealt me 100 damage or just absolutely nothing happened. I'm not really sure what the deal is. But his most scary attack, at least I thought at the time, was his condensed time move, which he fires this green laser at me and it takes me down to six HP. And he did this three times in a row. It was at this time where I was kind of wondering, is this dealing a flat amount of damage or is this taking a percentage of my health off? So I let the fight drag on just a little bit and he used condensed time again when I was at about 400 HP and it still dropped me down to like four to six HP. So at that moment, I knew it was percentage HP base, which was great. It wasn't a flat damage number. So that meant I can continue to be more offensive without the risk of dying if he were to use it. And after I understood that, I felt like the fight was immediately winnable. With him not having that fast of a turn speed, I'm able to act one time, maybe even twice. And so I'm able to keep those momentum pips rolling and I just destroy his health bar. I mean, utterly destroy his health bar. My Radiance crits were amazing. Now, while this doesn't really seem like that much of a final boss, do keep in mind this was the weak version. Whereas if we left up those four mini bosses, he would have been a lot tougher. But at the same time, I didn't really want to. I mean, I could always go back and try the stronger version, but the journey to get to this point was pretty insane. The grinds I had to go through, the amount of times so that I thought that this run was borderline impossible or I was going to bring in an additional party member just to beat the fight and continue the run. This was a hard fought win, and I am extremely happy that I decided not to give in and to continue this playthrough all the way to the end. Without a doubt, this has been the hardest challenge run I have done so far, and this is my second solo run as well, my first being Final Fantasy V. And with this run, this was really really fun and really amazing to do i'm really glad that i didn't give in and fail the run earlier to try and progress through the game the ending of this game was so heartfelt the first time i beat it towards the very end here when we go back in time setsuna absorbs the dark samsara that was causing so much pain and then she asks Ender to destroy her body so that way peace can finally be brought. And naturally we choose don't swing and the camera scrolls up, everything grays out. And then we just see the words, thank you. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun doing this kind of challenge run and seeing what I was able to do with this game. I looked and looked and looked for hours before trying to do a I Am Setsuna challenge run and I didn't find a single video out there on doing a challenge run. So if you guys see a challenge run, I would definitely like it if you guys were to join the Discord and post the link to that video. I'd really like to see what other people have done. I did have another idea originally when doing the playthrough before I turned it into a solo ender and that was to not use combos, techniques, um, or possibly any kind of magic as a three person party. But now that I've done a solo ender run, I mean, it doesn't really get more difficult than a solo character, kind of regardless of the game for the most part. 
So I don't know if I would ever do another challenge run of this game, mainly because I don't really know how I can make it more challenging. But let me know what you think in the comments. My other socials as well as past challenge runs are in the comments below as well. And I did update my Patreon. So everything for the Patreon tiers, every single person gets the same access and visibility as if you are a free member or a paid member. So the only difference is generosity of the individual person. There's no pay to win for additional benefits or anything like that. And I really think that that is the best structure for me moving forward. I don't believe in the whole pay to win thing. So do feel free to use the free membership on Patreon. I am still working on my Final Fantasy 13 challenge run. It does include the 100% trophy, which I don't know is obtainable with the rules I have in place. But I also picked up uh, several more RPGs that are on sale with the winter sale on Steam right now. So until then, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Comment, like, subscribe, all that stuff. And I will catch you guys in the next run. Bye bye.